silly it is to burst in on your pre-Christmas party and try to make something of this that's enjoyable. Uh, I don't know any Bible jokes that we can use this evening. <laughs> uh, but I, but in, in one sense, I suppose the, the, uh, the, the humorous introduction I can make is that you, someone had to have a sense of humor to invite a Presbyterian trained Benedictine Catholic monk to speak to you. Because I think both those traditions are, are sister traditions to your own here but not in the same tradition. So, uh, uh, The St. John's Bible is something that I've been involved at with since its very beginning. It, it sort of has its origins in a library. Uh, Donald Jackson, who's the scribe to the Queen of England, and I had just given a talk together at the Newbury Library in Chicago. And at the end of that, he proposed to me what was his life's ambition, which was to make a handwritten, illuminated, meaning pictures, monumental, meaning great big Bible. <laughs> and would St. John's be interested in this? And I recall at the time thinking to myself, no, there is no way we will ever do such a thing. But being someone who hates to say no, and knowing that I wasn't going to see him for a long time, I said, yes, I think we might. And I hoped he would forget. Uh, so I came home to St. John's and told no one about this for three months. And then finally, as a good uh, bureaucrat, proposed it to our president and buried the idea in a group of about a dozen ideas. This was about number seven. And to my utter shock, when I got to it and I said, oh, and there's this idea to make a handwritten illuminated Bible that Donald Jackson proposes, uh, the president said, we have to do that. And I distinctly remember at the time thinking his lips were saying, we have to do that. But his mind was saying, you have to do that. <laughs> and uh, I got the job of starting this project. And it's one of those cases where I've discovered, to make a theological point, I've discovered what the Holy Spirit's function is in Christian life. The Holy Spirit gets you started on some really great projects, but never tells you how much work it's going to be. <laughs> and then gets you so far in that it's too late to turn back but then gives you enough energy and vitality to finish it. I think that's true of all of life. Uh, certainly having a family with kids, if you knew how much work it was going to be to have four kids and the cost ahead of time, would you have sat down and said, well, how about three? Uh, well, I think if we'd have known how hard the St. John's Bible was going to be, uh, we'd have thought twice. We probably wouldn't have done it. Had we known then what we know now, that it does inspire people across the world who have seen it, we'd have done it a lot sooner. So it's one of those things that turned out to be much more challenging than we ever thought, but the Holy Spirit kind of got us into it and led us on. We decided to do this um, as a way to commemorate our 150th anniversary. In 1856, uh, German Benedictine monks came to Minnesota to minister to the German immigrants there and we wanted to do something that we thought would be a little more uplifting than, say, doing, building a building or putting up a plaque. And so this was it. And I'm going to cut uh, from, from sort of the reference to St. John's, except to say that St. John's has always been a rather entrepreneurial place. Uh, some of you have been touched by St. John's academically, but a lot of you have been touched by St. John's in another way that you may not appreciate. Uh, particularly among the things that we've done is start Minnesota Public Radio, which became National Public Radio. And one of the people who worked uh, on our campus and had a daily program for several years, his first years in radio was Garrison Keillor. So we are Lake Wobegon. Uh, so naturally, Lake Wobegon would be a place where you would want to make a Bible like this. Um, this was... Uh, something that took a lot of time to get going. We anticipated this would be a seven-year project. It turned out to be 16 years, uh, one of the many discoveries we've had. And this was the very first page that Donald Jackson presented to us. He worked with a committee at St. John's of Bible scholars and theologians and art historians uh, because he said, I'm an artist and I have read the Bible and I've gone to church, but if you leave it to me, you're going to get a very wooden interpretation. You need to tell me what's in the Bible that I should emphasize, what those passages might mean to the, to, in the original context, and what they can mean to readers today. 
And so the Committee on Elimination and Tax worked with Donald to supply those ideas, and it was Donald's job to translate their academic ideas into art. And in the process, this is a kind of dynamis, a, 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 an approach to artistic creation that we don't do today. No artist wants to work for a committee. And I can say this right here because I know I'm in kindred company. No committee of academics ever trusted anybody, uh, in particular an artist. So both sides had to overcome their, their natural inclination. And they did. And they created something that neither group could have done alone. Uh, this, in, in a case in point, is the, uh, the frontispiece to the Gospel of Matthew. It fits with the season. The Gospel of Matthew begins with the genealogy of Jesus. Abraham is the father of Isaac, and so on down the line. We asked Donald to pay attention to a number of themes. It was his job to figure out how to tease them out. We asked him to pay attention to the Jewish roots of Christianity. We asked him to pay attention to the importance of women in the Bible, to hospitality, and some other, other issues. How this shows up in, in here is he took the genealogy of Jesus and superimposed it on the menorah, the tree of life, and this becomes the family tree of Jesus. And you have Abraham here at the bottom with Sarah and Hagar, a subtle reminder that his ideas about marriage are somewhat different from ours. Jesus at the top with, Jesus, with Joseph and Mary. And what Donald did, if you read the opening of Matthew, the genealogy of Jesus, uh, I'm exaggerating, it, but it's about you know, 40 guys and three women. In real life, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> and so what he did was to go through the Bible and pull out the spouses and link them all together as couples in this genealogy. You can't change the Bible, but the art can tell the story that the Bible tells in its totality. So in the process, he put those names in English and Hebrew. So you use a menorah as the family tree of Jesus. You use the English and Hebrew as a reminder that Jew Jesus comes from a long line of Jewish ancestors going back to David. So that's how he brought out the themes that we gave him in this case. Uh, there are other things in here that he did that I'm not going to spend too much too much time at all, at all. But what he did do in in the decoration of this menorah was to put the double helix DNA molecule. The point of Matthew's genealogy is to say that Jesus comes from human stock. Jesus is God and man in the Christian tradition. If he is human, he shares our DNA. So he puts the DNA in here as a theological statement, but also he's borrowing from the bag of tricks of medieval illuminators uh, who always embedded hints about the text in the book. And I can give you lots of examples, but in this case, this says to someone 500 years from now that this book could not have been done before the discovery of the double helix DNA molecule. And he's put other hints through here. Um, You can. Hopefully, I'm going to press the right button. Yes, and this is the uh, page that faces it, and and those go together. What Don, you you can't see it quite so well with this page, but what Donald has tried to do is to uh, imitate the layout for, of the Gutenberg Bible, which is in turn uh, a layout of a 15th century uh, manuscript Bible with the smallest margin at the top, wider margins on either side, and the biggest margin down below. And this is the nativity from, from the Gospel of Luke. Uh, what Donald has tried to do is face up to the issue that all uh, sacred artists have had to contend with, and that is, how do you portray the divine? And so Donald has chosen to follow most Christian artists through the centuries by painting the divine in rather abstract terms. Even uh, Gothic and Romanesque depictions of Jesus were always somewhat abstract. In this case, he uses gold as the symbol of the presence of the divine. And so he's got the, the, the shaft of light coming from the heavens resting in the manger where Jesus is resting after being born. Uh, Donald tries to make use of a uh, all kinds of other illusions. 
if, you're, if you've traveled in Spain, you've seen billboards with this image of the bull mm -hmm. from, uh, I think, Domecq, Sherry. Uh, in any case, uh, and from the cave paintings uh, of ancient Iberia. Um, and then the, the Holy Family is over here, uh, or over here, rather, here, Mary. Uh, in any case, uh, what I'd like to say is that the St. John's Bible throughout is kind of dependent on our Christian tradition of incarnation, that God becomes human, God takes human form. And so at every point, that's the whole, the, the whole issue of creating Christian art that somehow embodies the divine in the human, not only in the person of Jesus Christ, but in the, in the uh, presence of all people who become believers. Um, so this becomes uh, his depiction of the nativity uh, that faces the, the gospel, opens the gospel of, of uh, Luke. I want to look at this because this allows me to speak about another important thing in the St. John's Bible and in the tradition of Christian art uh, that goes up all the way till today. Donald asked five, six other illuminators, artists, to help him. This was done by a man named Thomas Ingmeyer from San Francisco. And it's the Beatitudes, blessed are the peacemakers, and so on down the line. Uh, what Ingmeyer did was to put the Beatitudes in gold, and you'll see in the volume in here, uh, the gold just screams out at you. And then he takes the key word from the gold, the uh, from the Beatitudes, the blessed, and puts them in a, in a big column here, what looks like a big mess. But this allows me to make the point that I think we all need to take home with us tonight and always, and that is we need artists and composers and poets and writers and thinkers uh, for our very lives because they see life differently than the rest of us mere mortals. Without artists, without architects, our lives are impoverished. And this is the, the, uh, the, the lesson, the, 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 the sermon that Ingmar makes from the Beatitudes, but he does it in art. This looks like a kind of mess here with all this blessed going on. And if you take one out, you've got a little hole. If you take enough out, you've got a great big hole. And therein is his sermon. We tend to think of the blessings of God as a zero-sum game. If you've got three, that's three I can't have. Sometimes we even resent the fact that God gives too many blessings to other people, too many talents, and I can't do anything. I've since learned that when God gives other people talents, that means I don't have to do everything myself. And that's a better attitude to have. In any case, if one person does not use his or her blessings, then you have a hole in the column. If enough people do not use their blessings, the whole column will collapse and the fabric of our community collapses. So blessings given to one person are blessings given to all. They're meant to be used for all, not to be sort of hoarded by ourselves. And so it could take me quite a long time to say that in a pulpit, but visually Ingmeyer has said that in a way that you could tease out if you sat and looked at it for a while, and that's what artists do. Successful artists will give you an image, their interpretation of this visually, and you're going to learn something from it and you're going to add to it. I'm going to quickly go through some of these others. Uh, but I will touch on this. This is a, uh, uh, an error. When the scribe got to the bottom, discovered that she had left out a line. And so Donald borrowed from the bag of tricks of medieval calligraphers. And instead of erasing this, he put the missing line at the bottom, drew a box around it, drew this loop with a knot and a rope that goes up the side. And the bird there, with its talons, hauls up the, the rope, and with his beak, points to where the line goes. So it's all there, it's just in unconventional order. And some have said, Donald, throw that away. This is the Bible, it should be perfect. And Donald reminds us in his own little homily that uh, for most of human history, God used the fallible human hand to make his Bibles. The machine was our idea, and late. In the same way God prefers to use, to use us to do his work in the world rather than a machine or a robot, even though we make lots of mistakes. So that's the way God prefers to operate, to use us. 
Um, and even our machines make mistakes, and I don't have to go into great detail to describe the Wicked Bible to you, for those of you unfamiliar with the 1650 edition of the King James Version, which accidentally or on purpose left out one knot in the Ten Commandments. Uh. <laughs> Take your pick. <laughs> but it's sold out. So. <laughs> That's funny. This is done by a Greek Orthodox icon painter named Aidan Hart, who's done a number of important commissions in the UK, but several for Prince Charles's chapel. This gives you the, we asked him to put the flora and fauna of, of uh, the Midwest in here, excuse me. Um, and great Bibles in the Middle Ages also did that. And they did it as a way of grounding it in a place, but also to show the variety of God's creation, uh, that the Bible is filled with, with a huge variety of creation. And the Bible also has this huge range of human emotion, from, ranging from anger, to love, to whimsy, to jokes, to fun. There is fun and humor in the Bible. But part of God's creation are insects that don't seem to have any other purpose than to delight our eye. And, and as unnerving as that may be, we have to get used to the fact that God created other beings with as much lavish care as he did with us. The crucifixion, um, which is the other end of the incarnation, uh, and the nativity, suggests in this, in this depiction that in Donald's eyes the crucifixion is not a moment of tragedy or end or, or depression or that he's been overwhelmed by death. Rather, it's a moment of transformation. And so what he's done is to have a very different depiction than you'd see in Mel Gibson's portrait of the suffering Christ, for example, uh, which is another perfectly legitimate interpretation of how to view the crucifixion. But he pitches the cross forward, uses gold leaf to create this sense of great energy and transformation, suggesting that the crucifixion is only a moment of great transformation in, in Jesus, uh, and, and the cross is not the end, but the beginning of something new. The beginning of the Gospel of John, and he has written uh, Paul's, in Paul's description of Jesus uh, from the Colossians, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Written that sort of in longhand in gold here, and it bleeds into the figure of Jesus, which is kind of a visual pun from the from the from the gospel passage, which says, "And the Word became flesh." So these words become enfleshed in the figure of Jesus, or conversely, these the figure of Jesus gives rise to these words from Saint Paul. So it's a conversation between Paul and who Jesus Christ really is. Jesus and Mary Magdalene in the garden. Pentecost. When, because this was, this is so huge, it weighs 165 pounds, and like its medieval counterparts, it's being bound in several volumes, in this case, seven. So we asked Donald to do Gospels first, in case, as he said, if he fell off his perch, we'd have what we wanted first. <laughs> and then we had him do Pentateuch. Uh, and uh, we faced the issue of how do you portray human figures? In Minnesota, to make things absolutely simple, in Minnesota we believe that the Bible and the Holy Family all take place in, in Scandinavia. <laughs> but since we cannot... <laughs> Since we cannot convince the rest of the world of that, we told Donald, just go with what you'd like. And so he decided, since anthropologists suggest life and human life may have their origins in East Africa, what the heck, go with it. So you end up with the Garden of Eden that is much more colorful than anything you would get in Scandinavia. And then you end up with an Adam and Eve that is wonderfully provocative. And people have seen this at exhibits at the Library of Congress and the Minneapolis uh, Museum of Art and cried because for the first time in their lives they saw themselves in the Bible. And I, as, an, as a European, am thrilled that there's a great tradition of Christian art in which all my relatives show up. 
in the paintings. But at a certain point, I have to admit that we, we need to let other people into that garden. Uh, and, 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 and this, I think, is a very powerful statement. And those two, that's how they fit together. Jacob's Ladder, the Ten Commandments, which I'd love to dwell on but can't. But I just want to give you a sense of the great variety that's in here. And that each one of these is its own sermon. This is the Israelites going into the uh, Promised Land. It's a scene of great violence, actually, which was very tough for the artists. Uh, they did not want to portray violence. And so uh, they struggled with that. And so when they came to the historical books of the Old Testament, um, they went, they kind of did an about face, even with the insects. They started to have the insects do what insects do in real life, tear each other apart. Whereas in other books, it, they're, they're more specimens. And Psalms. What Donald has done, you can barely see this, is this fuzzy uh, gold here. He took a CD of the monks of St. John singing chant and did a digital voice print and painted that across the book of Psalms. It's us singing the Psalms. And in the next slide you will see what uh, he also made sure that to include other traditions, other musical traditions. So he's got a, a, a Jewish men's choir singing the Psalms, a Native American, uh, Hindu, Greek Orthodox, Muslim, Buddhist. And he puts them in vertically, and they meet periodically. And his sermon is this. We may all start from various points of view in our search for God, but in sacred song there are moments when our search for God converges, and we're all going after the same thing, which is a message of great hope in a world that could use some hope. Not all calligraphy has to be sweetness and light. And so here is this accusation of God to the Hebrews, yet you did not return to me, uh, is anything but sweetness and light. Donald had the luxury of being able to go down to the British Museum whenever he ran out of ideas and look at stuff. And so when he was doing the prophets, he just went down and looked at the Assyrian sculpture groupings in the British Museum because that's what the prophets were looking at when they were in exile. And so you'll see references to that. The suffering servant from Isaiah. Ezekiel's vision of the temple. Ezekiel's vision of the dry bones, which is kind of a dramatic sermon here. But I will save my, my words for this. This is the, the vision of the, uh, the, the, uh, the sacred woman, the, the, uh, from, from Ecclesia, from, it's the wisdom, wisdom of Solomon. And it's the vision of the, uh, what we call it, the, the wisdom woman. Uh, because the, the uh, wisdom literature tends to attribute feminine qualities to God. And so, so Donald changed his color palette for the wisdom volumes. And then this is the mirror of wisdom. And Donald had a portrait of a woman hanging in his office for 30 years, always wondering, what in the world am I going to use this for? And finally he realized, this is the portrait of wisdom. And so he put her face in gold leaf and, and platinum leaf six times. And it's a very countercultural statement, because this is the, the ideal woman. It's not the ideal American advertising woman. Uh, this woman will not sell cars. But her jewelry is the lines in her face that comes from a lifetime of serving her friends, her family, her guests, and anybody who needs her help. And this is the truly beautiful woman. But you could also say that about the, uh, the senior male as well. This is just for fun. This is uh, a, my, a garden. And so he's used a medieval Middle Eastern garden design to create a garden wall around the text. And Donald had fun with this too. We tend to forget that the Bible does have whimsy in it. It is not just a big solemn document. There is a range of human emotion through there. 
including whimsy. Uh, this I like because this is what you get with a reed pen. This is a quill pen. Quill pens are what Donald used for this. Turkey and goose. And this is Donald cutting quills. This is the last of my slides. I apologize for rushing through this, but I wanted to leave just a little bit of time for questions in case there are any. Or it's your chance to run away. Yeah. Where is the original artwork kept? The original artwork is kept at St. John's, except for things that we, something when we loan it out for an exhibit. Like there is an exhibit with about 30 folios at the Canton Museum of Art in Ohio this month and next month. And then in the winter, those folios will go to uh, Palm Beach in Florida. The Bible likes to go to, to the south during the winter. We discovered. And I don't like it any more than any of my other colleagues, but we have to go too. So, but uh, the, the, we always have an exhibit at St. John's with folios on display, and all the others are stored uh, in a climate controlled spot. Yeah. Um, how many writers actually hand wrote all these pages? I mean, how many people, it looked like there were many, many different people writing. Right, there were. There were five uh, scribes who helped Donald. So Don, with Donald it was six, and then he had six guest artists. Now the issue that was a challenge with the scribes, uh, the artists were allowed to have their own style. The scribes could not. They had to go with one design. And that was a major issue because if you think about how artists think of themselves today, no artist wants to stake their reputation on looking like somebody else. Uh, so it was tough. One quit under the pressure. Um, but also, even if you're trying to imitate one style, one script, you still have minute variations. So he, to ensure that we not see those variations, all facing pages, are done by the same scribe. Oh. Now that may sound like an easy deal, except that books, the way you make and bind books has not changed between the Middle Ages and now. You take big sheets, fold them, and then cut them and sew them together. So you take three pieces of vellum. Each piece of vellum has four pages, two on each side. And then you take three pieces of vellum and sew them together and fold them. So those three pieces of vellum make 12 pages. Of those 12 pages, only two pages naturally face each other on the same piece of vellum. So they have to figure out where the other pages are going to be, what, what other pages the other pages are going to be facing. So that was all mapped out on a computer. But the, uh, it didn't matter if the, after you turn the page that somebody else did that script, because you turn it so quickly you can't compare. But it was a big issue. Yeah. Well, if, if you've left some of the animations out and so forth, um, the book doesn't stay bound? Or? Right, the book is not bound yet. Oh, okay. It will be bound in about five years when we have a gallery prepared for it. But for now, the real virtue of not binding it is that we can loan, we can send folios out on a tour that can have as many as 40 or 50 folios. The virtue of the Heritage Edition, which you have on display here, is it was our first feel of this as a real live book. Donald had never seen this as a real live book until this was made. Up to now he's only looked at uh, 280 leaves or folios. So, th so this is kind of an exciting thing for us to see it come to fruition uh, as it will be in five years. And, and are there multiple uh, bound copies in the book? Yeah, the, of the Heritage Edition, which you have here, each set has seven volumes uh, because it's just too big to put into one volume. It would split apart. And that's the way they did it with medieval Bibles. The Gutenberg Bible was in two volumes. Uh, the Winchester Bible, which this was based on, had seven to start with. It's been rebound into four volumes. Uh, but they regularly did that, just partly for mobility. Uh, there's a huge Bible in the Royal Library in Stockholm that must weigh like 300 pounds. It's called the Devil's Bible. Uh, in any case, those big Bibles, though, they have to be in multiple volumes. What's next? What's next? Well, uh, we want uh, uh, the next thing, two things. One, we want to finish and finish developing our exhibit tour over the next four or five years. 
uh, and then bind this and build a place to house it. In the meantime, to continue to uh, share the Heritage Edition, and we've uh, placed about 115 sets of those around the world, and so that's, that's the other part of the what's next. But our goal originally was to share this with as many people as possible. We've been able to do it physically through reproductions, uh, through exhibits, but also digital. So we have an online uh, museum, in a sense, where you can see all the pages one at a time, too. Free? Free, yeah. But you can also order one to be printed and sent to you as well. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, so you can, that was my question, so you right. can purchase them? You can purchase. And how big are the ones that if I go online to buy? Uh, the, 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 ones on, the ones you buy online, they're Gicle prints, and, and they're either one inch smaller or one inch larger than the real thing. They're not exactly the same size. And then there are prints of special uh, illuminations where it's just that part of it, not the whole page. Gotcha. So you can't buy the book? You can buy, actually, time. there are, there are <laughs> coffee table size books, the seven volumes, which are available. You can, yeah, so there, for your, some people here, in fact, own uh, some of the oh, okay. trade editions, we call them. And then you can buy a heritage edition as well. Go for it. Yeah. Are there written interpretations of the paintings along the lines of what you just did for us today? Yes, there are. We've got, there's several books out now that have begun to enunciate that. The one thing I would encourage you, it, it helps to have someone tell you what it means. But I think at the same time, it's very important. It's, not, it's true not just for the St. John's Bible, but it's any art, any museum. You know, listen to the docent, but when you're done listen to the, to listening to the docent, engage your brain and think what, about, what it means to you. And so I, you can read from the several volumes about what these mean. But Donald will be the first to tell you that he's given you something, and once he's given it to us, it's ours. And so you're going to come up with some meaning that he never thought of as an artist. And that's what good art does. Uh, and I gave the, on the Ten Commandments, I gave this long explanation at the Phoenix Art Museum a few years ago. And at the end, this young woman came up and said, well, I see what you're saying, but this is what I see. She explained what she saw. And I said, well, you know, that's better than what I saw. So you're right. <laughs> so so there, there helps, but they're not the last word. You have the last word for yourself. And so that's what I would encourage you to do. And to keep in mind that uh, think of the artist, think of the musician, the singer, uh, the guys who are playing here, the architect who designs the buildings. Uh, they're all people who see life with a different vision than we have. Thank God we have them, because if it was up to me to design the buildings and to sing the music, we'd all be in bad shape. Uh, but we need these people. <coughs> and Christmas is a particularly wonderful time because we have a wonderful corpus of music to enjoy. And all this visual representation of the nativity comes into our lives. So it's a time when our senses get overwhelmed with stuff by the commercial side, but draw from our Christian tradition uh, to enrich ourselves that way. And, and you realize just what it is that artists and musicians do for us. Uh, it's not to deny what's done in the pulpit uh, as terribly important, but these people add a wonderful supplement. And I think that's, for me, the big takeaway from the St. John's Bible, what an artist can do for us.